Thank you, Hervé, uh, for your introduction. So I'm a biologist. There are not many biology talks uh, in, this, uh, in this workshop uh, this year. Um, but my talk is going to be very general and actually address uh, many misconceptions or false ideas that, not bi that every human being has regarding biological evolution. And this includes not only physicists, chemists, and the common of mortals, but also uh, biologists. Uh, Please interrupt me at any moment if you don't follow or if you want any cl uh, clarification during my talk. So I'm going precise, more precisely to address misconceptions that have to do with uh, the origin of life and astrobiology because this is what uh, this uh, workshop or this school is about. But first of all, because we are talking about biological <coughs> evolution, uh, we need to know what is evolution and how evolution works. So evolution is a, a process uh, that can be explained by two types of mechanisms. Uh, the first one uh, is very simple actually. Uh, you start by uh, one organism or uh, uh, different organisms that have uh, that reproduce and during this reproduction you have variation that is introduced. We now understand which is the basis of this uh, uh, variation, which is mutation, and there is a genetic basis for this. So you have reproduction with variation in the offspring. So you generate different uh, 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 individuals in the offspring that vary by different features. And this is the first step of this first mechanism I'm speaking about. And then upon this standing variation, you have natural selection what we call natural selection, that eliminates from the, this off, offspring uh, the variants that are less fit for a particular environmental condition. So in this particular case, uh, well, uh, all the red things are eaten first and then you have things that, are, uh, that maybe can hide better. Uh, so you have uh, then a selection that is operated at this level, you, you remove out all the things that are less fit to a particular for a particular environment, and then you start again the process, go on and you go on. So this is a very well known uh, phenomenon that we now call Darwinian evolution because it was Charles Darwin's famous uh, book on the origin of species, who had this, who expressed these ideas uh, better. Uh, and it has these two steps, uh, reproduction in introducing variation and then natural selection operating on this standing variation. In particular, given environmental conditions, the environment is key. Environmental selection is key. And there is another, there, there are other mechanisms that are also involved in evolution. Uh, they are based exactly on the same idea that uh, we have organisms that reproduce and yield uh, uh, a, a varied offspring, so different types of <coughs> individuals, different phenotypic properties uh, that reflect different uh, genotypes actually. But then you can have uh, neutral processes, processes that are more stochastic, that have to do with chance. Uh, and many of these kind of processes have to do with bottlenecks, demographic bot bottlenecks. <coughs> so that you can have by chance in a given place, you imagine that you have an island colonized just by uh, a subset of this initial population. And then even if this organism would not be the more fit for a particular environment for that island, but because it's the only one that arrives by chance, it gets to reproduce and leaves uh, an offspring. And then you can have selective processes uh, from that. So. This is what people call drift. So these are neutral processes, often dealing with demographic issues uh, that lead uh, to uh, evolution, those changes over time of biological organisms. So to summarize, evolution is a process that can be explained by two major kinds of mechanisms that we need in evolution, reproduction, variation, natural selection, and drift, which is neutral evolution. And so with this type of natural processes, natural causes, you can explain uh, the patterns uh, that of biological distribution that we see now today. So the diversity of species, uh, how species relate evolutionarily to one another, 
uh, that's with what we call phylogeny, in a sense. So usually we represent that with trees, genealogical trees, if you want. And how species distribute across space and time. That's what we call biogeography. So with these natural causes, natural phenomena, we can explain all what we see uh, today in terms of species distribution and diversity. Um, however, uh, uh, there are many misconceptions or m many people, including, yeah, including many biologists, have only partial understanding of these mechanisms and this leads uh, to uh, misconceptions. Uh, we are going to see examples, but what are the potential causes of these misconceptions? Uh, something that is very inherent to human beings, which is uh, uh, teolo teleological thinking, the idea that things appear uh, for a purpose in particular, so we tend humans to ask why, and we have this idea that things appear to do something for something. This is teleologi teleological thinking. Uh, also, something that is very human is essentialist thinking, maybe not in all cultures, but for sure in Western cultures. We think that th uh, think things in general have an essence, they are, and so uh, this is a little bit counterintuitive for evolution because uh, things are evolving all the time. So this relates, for instance, to the idea that species are, uh, uh, don't move, don't evolve, actually. So there is a um, uh, kind of a, um, tension here between the uh, uh, intuitive ideas that think uh, things don't move, don't evolve, and the reality of evolution, things are changing, species are evolving all the time. So a species is not fixed in time, it's something that evolves. And then of course, anthropocentric thinking, which is uh, extremely important, and I'm, come back, I, I'm coming back to this. Uh, but in, in addition to these causes, I would think that in some cases, they are, there are causes that are related to particular disciplines, and in particular, I will make uh, I will evoke the particular uh, views of physics and chemistry on complexity. This is a complex issue, uh, but w I will come back to this point later. Uh, that can influence or induce some misconceptions. So that birds evolve wings to fly. So I'm going to use quotes uh, in, in my slides. Whenever I put a quote, is, uh, there might be a misconception or something, uh, a false idea or something that is uh, blurred. Uh, so that birds of all things to wings to fly um, is a perfect example of teolo teleological thinking. The idea that uh, uh, actually uh, the function uh, creates the organ. It's a bit Lamarckian in, in that sense. But actually, this is not true, and uh, most evolu evolutionary biologists will tell you that evolution proceeds by adaptation. Uh, An adaptation means that you have little changes, most mutations induce very tiny changes that uh, can be selected over time, and only uh, for a long period of time you can have an important change, such as the emergence of an organ the wing, so that before the function fly could be performed by such an organ, there must have been intermediate steps, and actually we see them in the fossil record, of organs that were not uh, suitable to fly, uh, but little by li but were selected for another function that was not flight, until at a given moment they also could be used to flight and then the function flight was co-opted, was, we call, uh, biologists talk about acceptation for that phenomenon. It means that an organ that appears uh, selected for some other function is all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but at a given point is useful for another function. And so there is this uh, idea of acceptation. You can uh, attribute to a long uh, member uh, a function flight at a given moment. So that's, that's the idea. So when biologists say that birds have evolved wings to fly, actually they are using a metaphor of purpose. 
So it is valid that you do that you do it that you do this, but be aware that this is just a metaphor because evolution is actually purposeless. There is not a finality, uh, and so things are selected out. Okay, so this should be very clear because it's not always the case. And then I've spoken about uh, uh, the anthropocentric biases. Um, there are due to many things. Of course, there is an observational bias that is related to our own constraints, physical constraints. So we are animals and we have given uh, particular sensorial organs uh, that allows us to uh, perceive differences in the environment around us at a given level, but not at all levels. I'm going to show you an example. Uh, of course, the anthropocentrism, meaning that any species and any uh, human being, in the case of the human species, places itself or himself or herself at the center of the universe. It's a matter of survival. And of course, this uh, uh, also biases the interpretation of the natural world. Uh, so when we humans look around in nature, uh, we see a wide variety of animals and plants that we have been classifying for uh, hundreds of years, uh, thousands of years possibly. Uh, and well, uh, biologists like to represent this now in form of trees. Uh, uh, different uh, the species are places, placed at the end of the branches and uh, close branches represent uh, rela related species uh, in evolutionary terms. Anyway, the idea here is we see a wide variety, we have classified that, and many people have described species for many years. And so when you go to catalogs of species, mm -hmm. yeah, lists of species, and you go to animals, you see that there are more than 1,000,000 species described, mm -hmm. uh, of which uh, one million more or less are insects, so you would have the idea uh, that insects really dominate the planet. Uh, almost 300,000 uh, species of plants. And when you go to lists of bacteria and uh, archaea, uh, so prokaryotes, uh, described in catalogs, well, maybe there are 10,000, maybe now there are a few more, but certainly not more than 15,000 species. So you have the impression that the world is dominated by animals and in particular by insects. By uh, described species, okay, most biological diversity uh, relies on animals. <coughs> this is of course wrong, and this relates precisely to our ability to uh, study microbes, uh, among other things. So, our perception of the natural world is biased. So, if I show you the, uh, this list of portraits, uh, you will differentiate the different individuals. Okay, uh, well. Some more than others, the French, uh, maybe some old politicians. Um, but if you go to more distant human populations, and the opposite is uh, also true, well, it is already more difficult to differentiate individuals. And in the, the reverse is true as well, okay? You take a, a member of an Asian population, and it will have more problems to differentiate uh, individuals from Western populations. And if you go to another animal species, well, it is already more difficult to differentiate individuals. Take a fly, uh, different flies, can you make the difference? Well, it's, it begins to be complicated to differentiate individuals uh, in, in this type of animal species. And when it comes to bacteria, here we have a problem, and a very important problem, because we are not only unable to differentiate individuals from one another, but we are also unable to differentiate different species between them, just by the morphology, that by, the, uh, by the kind of cues that we can perceive with our senses. Of course, bacteria are small, we are big, etc. so there are <coughs> many factors. So our perception of the natural world is biased and it's a problem of scale, uh, of phylog phylogenetic scale. The more distant to our, you are, uh, to another species or to another kind of population, the more problems you have to differentiate individuals. There's a problem of spatial scale, bacteria are small, we are big, and our senses are not prepared 
to perceive the chemical differences that are operating at this level. So we are not prepared to see these differences. And I've also included the temporal scale because we humans have problems because our lifespan is short. We have problems to grasp very big, very long time scales. And actually, if you go to the uh, history of life that you could draw in, 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 in a very <coughs> Uh, short and schematic view like this, so we have that the Earth appeared or accreted like 4.56 billion years ago, life appeared maybe around 4 uh, billion years ago, and then we are here today. We know uh, that uh, eukaryotes must have appeared around, let's say, uh, 2 billion years ago, multicellular eukaryotes expanded, even if they appear a bit earlier, around the Cambrian explosion, so 500 uh, million years ago. Uh, so in, in, in this time scale, actually microbes dominated the Earth for a long period. So you have to wait until the Cambrian explosion or a bit earlier uh, to have really multicellular forms that start to dominate the planet. And then for more than uh, two, three billion years, uh, only microbes were populating the Earth. So this means that there is a huge evolutionary time, so it's a huge time for organisms to diverge. And this is actually one of the reasons why, uh, together with others, for like generation time higher in, in, in prokaryotes, for instance, as compared to animals and plants, mm. um, uh, that explains why most of the biological diversity lies is hidden in the microbial world, even if we have problems to see it, okay? So, in, um, I think that the, the pre video projector is too light, but anyway. Uh, so, in a, in a s this is a summary slide to show you just our, uh, our uh, uh, big classification of life. So, this is a, a schematic phylogenetic tree showing the picture of life that we have today. Uh, we no recognize three major group of organisms, uh, bacteria and archaea. These are prokaryotic organisms, unicellular in general organisms uh, that uh, we call prokaryotes because they have the genetic material uh, directly in the cytoplasm uh, that are extraordinarily diverse. And they look alike in many cases by the morphology, so you cannot differentiate these organisms by morphology, but they have many different kinds of metabolism. And I'm referring more particularly to energy and carbon metabolism, the way that these organisms gain energy. They can use a wide variety of electron donors and acceptors, and they can also fix carbon in different ways. And then we have the eukaryotes, where you have uh, animals, and plants, so uh, animals are somewhere here. Um, in the opistocons, metazoa, you have plants, uh, like terrestrial plants, with, which are here within Viridi plantae. So each triangle here represents a big collection of organisms. You have fungi, for instance. But most of these other lineages, so triangles representing thousands of species, within eukaryotes are also microbes. So animals, and fungi and land plants are just a tiny fraction of the eukaryotes. Most of, uh, of the eukaryotic diversity is also microbial, like in the case of bacteria and archaea. So microbes dominate the phylogenetic diversity in the planet. Uh, that's for sure. And then you have the, the emergence of multicellularity. So this is uh, animals, this is fungi. You have red algae. Uh, some green algae and plants, and then things like uh, uh, brown algae, pheophytes like laminaria, and these kind of things. And there are some other groups. So multis this tells you already one thing, it is that multicellularity appears independently in different eukaryotic groups. Uh, so it's not something very difficult to make, multi multicellular organisms. It has occurred independently in the uh, biological history. So the idea of placing this uh, uh, slide here is just to convey for those of you who are not biologists how we classify life today, and also to convey the message that most biological diversity is microbial. But we have failed so far, or until a few years ago, maybe a few decades ago, to study 
the diversity of this microbial life just because we didn't have the tools and our senses do not uh, allow us to uh, see the differences <laughs> in microbial species. So, uh, what we have done we, to study microbes is uh, to use technology at the, and, and there I'm going to talk about two kinds of uh, methodological revolutions to study microbes. One is the microscope. Uh, so this is something, uh, a historical review if you want. So uh, actually the study of microbes have, has always been uh, 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 pushed by uh, technological developments. The microscope that first allowed us to recognize the very existence of microbial life and in particular of bacteria. This is work by Anthony van Heuwenhoek uh, um, at the onset of the eight, 18th century. Uh, and then uh, with the progression of microscope, you have better the microscopes, you could uh, actually, uh, we realized many important things. One very important thing was uh, uh, what we call now the cell theory by Theodor Schwann. So the realization uh, that all organisms are cells or are composed by cells. Multicellular organisms, they have many cells. So this is something that we learned by uh, uh, using microscopes. And then uh, we could even start to reconstruct uh, initial phylogenetic trees based on morphology, including microorganisms, because for some of them, like eukaryotes, you can see differences in morphology. And so you have this very famous phylogenetic tree by Ernst Haeckel, uh, who big uh, German uh, uh, evolutionary biologist, you could say, a uh, fervent, uh, fervent uh, admirer of uh, Charles Darwin, who actually made a first tree of life based on morphology, including uh, what he called at the time protista, that includes uh, 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 unicellular forms, let's say, uh, mostly. And then with the emergence or uh, the development of electronic uh, electron microscopes, you could, we could uh, already quite late in the 20th century, but quite advanced, uh, differentiate something very important. And this, uh, that is uh, the difference between two major structural types of cells, the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. So prokaryotes, as I was saying, bacteria and archaea have the uh, genetic material directly immersed in the cytoplasm of the cell, whereas in the case of eukaryotes, you have a nucleus defined by uh, an endomembrane system. And this di dichotomy was really established in as late as the 1960s, even if the term eukaryotes uh, predates that uh, date. But the modern meaning of prokaryote and eukaryote comes from the 1960s, so it's relatively quite late. So all this um, uh, was uh, some, somehow something derived from observ uh, observing microbes under the microscope. And then, the w but we were li still limited in the kind of species that we could study with that. And we had to wait to another revolution, which is the molecular revolution. So, of course, based on the discovery that nucleic acids and in particular DNA were the genetic material of the cell, the structure of DNA that offer uh, a very nice mechanism to explain um, heredity uh, and etc., and, and also mutation, and that also allowed uh, allowed the development of uh, molecular biology and molecular phylogeny, and that uh, was very important to solve or at least uh, try to solve a, a real problem that microbiology had at the time. Uh, a very simple problem is that we know uh, that there are very few differences in terms of morphology, I'm telling this once and again, <coughs> between different microbial species, uh, and we cannot uh, est establish phylogenetic uh, evolutionary relationships uh, between organisms just based on the morphology. So this means uh, that we cannot, based on morphology, uh, establish a natural classification. A natural classification of organisms means a phylogenetic a, a classification based on evolutionary relationships. So that in the, in the 60s, 1960s, Roger Stanier, famous microbiologist, 
uh, sadly concluded that the ultimate scientific goal of biological classification could not be achieved in the case of bacteria, precisely because we lacked uh, uh, traits that could inform us about the uh, phylogenetic, the evolutionary relatedness uh, uh, between organisms. So until this time, what micro, um, microbiologists were doing was applying an operational classification system that was not natural, that was not based on evolutionary relationships. So you, what you did was to cultivate, uh, we don't see very well, but uh, these are supposed to be tubes, uh, SA tubes, this is a petri dish, so you can, from natural samples, um, try to isolate uh, individual microbial species. How do you do that? Uh, well, you try just to get one single cell in your tube or in your petri dish and let it to multiply by uh, clonal growth and you have all the cells that are equal or identical more or less or uh, descend from the first uh, cell that you put into your medium. And from that you can study morphology, of course, if you have something that can be distinguished, or you can grow this organism in different uh, types of media and uh, study the uh, phenotypic properties in, term, in terms of metabolic properties, if you produce acid, if you are an aerobic or anaerobic organism, if you can precipitate something, if you produce uh, uh, some kind of sugars, etc. So you can study the properties and then with that you establish what uh, people called at the time numerical taxonomies. You make big tables of properties and then you relate organisms by properties but not by evolutionary relationships. And so this was limited, okay? Um, and things change very radically with the development of molecular phylogeny. So molecular phylogeny was developed uh, uh, from the 1960s thanks to this uh, fundamental idea by Emil Zuckerkandl and Linus Pauling uh, that in the sequence of uh, uh, macrobiological polymers, heteropolymers like DNA or RNA, uh, so the different bases that you can use, ATGC, AUGC, and in the amino acid sequence of proteins, so big, uh, big macromolecules, you can store evolutionary information. Okay? Um, so you have combinations of letters that give you different words if you want, wish, and then in principle you could pick one molecule that is present in all living beings, and by comparing the sequence of this molecule in the different organisms, you could make phylogenetic trees and relate species evolutionary to one another. And that was actually the idea that uh, um, tried to develop Carl Woss, and we call that the Woosian Revolution because it really impact, it has impacted modern biology. All the genomics that is done, you talk about microbiomes, you talk about genomics, you talk about anything is based on, uh, largely on work by, on this idea of uh, Zuckerkandel and Pauling, and on work by Carl Woss, uh, comparing organisms based on uh, identifying molecules, molecules that are used as identity markers of organisms. So the molecule that Carl was <coughs> chose as an identity marker of organisms was the RNA of the small uh, uh, ribosomal subunit. So the ribosome is something essential, all cells have ribosomes, it is there where you make proteins. So that's something essential, everybody makes proteins, so, and everybody has this, this particular uh, gene and uh, RNA in the ribosomes and it is quite conserved because the function is very important. But it's also relatively variable so that you can see differences because if it's too conserved you cannot make differences. And so, well, uh, the idea is that using these molecules actually Calvos could uh, demonstrate that uh, you can build phylogenetic trees. He took species coming from different eukaryotes, animals and plants and fungi, and from different kinds of bacteria, uh, of many different kinds, and, uh, and, and so actually he could build this kind of trees, uh, showing uh, phylogenetic relationships based on molecules, and in doing so, 
uh, there was a second outcome that we didn't expect at the time. He discovered that some organisms that were supposed to be bacteria, because morphologically they look that alike, they were unicellular microbes, very simple in principle, well, they detach in this type of trees and form another group that is apart. He called this group archibacteria, we now call it archaea, it's the third domain of life. They look morphologically like bacteria, but molecularly they are very different. Actually, they look much more like eukaryotes in terms of molecular biology. So a third domain of life. Okay, uh, this is how, uh, to explain how we came with this idea of building uh, molecular trees, phylogenetic trees from molecules. That was very important. But not only for that, it has another application, and I'm coming back to uh, microbial diversity, and it is that uh, this type of molecular approaches, the study of molecule molecules as ad identifiers of organisms and of microbial cells, was very important to solve another big problem that microbiologists had had for a long time, and it is actually the problem of studying microbial diversity in nature. Because we know and we knew for, we have known for a long time, that only a tiny fraction of the organisms that are present in, a, in, in the uh, environment are amenable to culture. So you can cultivate, a lot, may some people say one, 0.1, others will say 1. It depends on the environment and the effort that you put. But only a tiny fraction of the organisms present in the environment can be cultivated in pure culture in the lab for many reasons. So it means that most of the diversity escapes uh, the study, scientific study. Uh, but these molecular approaches actually offered us the possibility to study microbial diversity in nature just by looking at the molecules that they contain and at this, the genes encoding, for instance, for the ribosomal RNA genes. <clears throat> so the idea is very simple. You cannot cultivate the microbes, but you, know, you can know who is there just by studying these markers. So you, what you do in practice and we, what we have been doing, uh, not going too much into the details, but I'm going to give some details. We, we have been doing for many years, several decades, since let's say the late uh, 1980s, is to extract DNA from natural communities. You take soil, you take water that you can collect, uh, in skin bottles, for instance, you take your gut, whatever. You extract the DNA from the whole microbial community, and then you can amplify those genes uh, that we are using as molecular identifiers with primers, okay, this, uh, and amplify that by PCR reaction, polymerase chain reaction, to have a lot of material, that's the only purpose. And then you can separate, so there are rows here, I don't know if you see them, but there, there are rows. You, can, you could then separate them by a cloning strategy, so that every colony would have uh, an insert containing a different gene. So these are details. But then you could sequence by Sanger sequences, uh, Sanger sequencing, a technique, uh, sequencing technique, uh, these uh, individual genes, okay? And then you could compare the sequences that you get from nature to sequences existing in databases from cultured species. <coughs> and see which are the closest relatives, and then you could build phylogenetic trees, as, as, you, as I have shown, and classify the sequences in phylogenetic groups that are already known. And so you can attribute, then you can uh, uh, actually describe the microbial diversity in your sample by doing this approach. And these kind of approaches have been used for many years, as I said, and had led or, or led already since the very beginning to the discovery of new groups of um, particular bacteria and archaea. Two examples, two early examples, the discovery by Giovannoni and co-workers of a group called SAR11. It's possibly this microbe, Pelagibacter clade, well, it's a group of a lineage of microbes. It's possibly the most abundant microbe on, on Earth. So it's uh, quite, quite ubiquitous in the uh, water column. It's present in ocean, huge amounts of this microbe. Uh, so it's a member of uh, the alpha proteobacteria, tiny genome, etc. Well, it was discovered by this approach in uh, 1990. And then uh, another group, two groups of archaea that were discovered in the ocean again. The ocean was kind of, uh, has always been like a, uh, the first environment with, where these kind of techniques have, uh, have been applied. 
Uh, and then with the discovery of different archaeal groups, uh, notably uh, this group uh, that we called Group 1, Kernachiota, now it's called Tomarchiota, a different kingdom of Archaea for biologists, if they have some notions about that, and another group of Archaea, groups that are very important uh, in the environment, and, uh, and also for, in particular, this group of Archaea for the nitrogen cycle. It has changed our view of the nitrogen cycle on Earth, but well, that's another story. So, those are examples that we have, over the years, accumulated many sequences by this approach. You have uh, mm, curated databases of sequences where you accumulate these ribosomal RNA sequences uh, that can be more or less long and, and you eliminate chimeras, you can have artifacts, etc. And the thing is that uh, uh, you can define OTUs, operational taxonomic units, according to, um, that would be for microbiologists or proxy for species. It means that uh, two, uh, you, you are going to say that two organisms belong to the same species when the sequences of this gene marker for these two organisms is more than a given percentage identical. So in the case of species, people are going to use thresholds like 97, 98, sometimes 99% identity. So everything that is more than 97, 98, 99% uh, per percent identity, you're going to put it in the same OTU, meaning the same species, quote unquote. And so this is 2014, but at that time, uh, around for a, for, a, for the threshold of 90, 98%, uh, around 75 uh, percent of the new sequences deposited in database in databases corresponded to new species in new OTUs. And when you go down to the genus level, that should be around 50 per, uh, 95 uh, percent identity, around half of the new sequences from environmental studies deposited in this type of databases were new. This is a few years ago. And the trend is even higher now. For one simple reason, we have more high throughput methods to analyze uh, sequence diversity in nature. We can explore deeper the diversity in nature. Uh, and uh, typically what we do today is to use, uh, we extract DNA, we don't pass uh, through uh, cloning steps. And you just sequence what you amplify, the gene that you amplify using methods that produce man many million sequences. Of course, you, this analysis, you cannot do them by hand, so now you cluster sequences that look like one another, that have a percentage of similarity by different uh, kinds of tools, bioinformatic tools. There are several, so you try to eliminate artifacts because there are artifacts, etc. And then you define uh, OTUs by uh, similarity in general, and then you can take one uh, representative sequence per OTU, so per, per species if you wish, and place it in a phylogenetic tree. And in this way, we are refining our studies of microbial diversity. So I'm not going too much into the details with, with this here because it's not the uh, objective, but I just want to make you um, aware uh, that these kind of approaches are revealing a massive amount of diversity that is far away from being saturated. There are other tools that we can use uh, that we call metagenomics, where you don't understand, when you don't only look at one single gene, but you study the genomes of different organisms and you can reconstruct genomes from metagenomes using different kinds of tools, meaning that you study also genes that are involved in protein coding sequences, or in protein coding and potentially in functions. And then you can apply, apply other fancy techniques to try to separate individual cells and study individual cells that you cannot analyze uh, uh, otherwise. And you can amplify to the genomes from individual cells. Uh, so these are methods that we use uh, uh, either by micro manipulation or by more high throughput methods like flow cytometry where you can uh, pass cells through capillaries, very thin capillaries, and depending on uh, properties that you want to distinguish, uh, linked to fluorescence that you can activate, 
uh, you can sort them and, and in individual wells or, or in populations or through mi microfluidics. So all of the, these techniques are actually helping us to um, describe microbial diversity in nature. And we can have access through whole genome or whole transcriptome amplification, I'm not going into the in details here, of organisms that you cannot cultivate, that people call microbial dark matter. So groups, we know there are full groups of organisms for which we don't have uh, any uh, culture species in the lab, but we can access to their genomes uh, by these kind of approaches and then by the kind of genes that they have, you can predict in some cases the functions that they make and start thinking about what are they doing in the environment, okay? So, kinds of techniques that we use. This is useful to know what the microbes are doing, maybe, but this is also useful to populate the tree of life. So this is a more recent view of the tree of life, 2016, based on not only ribosomal RNA genes, but on other protein coding genes uh, extracted from these genomes that you can gain through metagenomics or by single cell genomics. Uh, so you, here you have the bacteria, and here you have the archaea, and eukaryotes are these things in green. Uh, what you already see is that bacteria really are extremely diverse. There are of course biases because we have not completed our picture uh, of the microbial diversity. And, uh, and the other thing that I want to mention here is that all the branches shown with a red dot correspond to organisms, to lineages for which we lack representatives in culture. So this uh, diversity has been discovered directly in the environment by using these techniques. We have ap applied these studies to many different types of environment now for many, many years. Environments that are more classical, like the ocean, like uh, fresh water, soils, forests, etc. But also extreme environments. And I'm, I'm coming back to this uh, schematic tree of life. That is extremely dense in terms of uh, uh, microbial diversity. So, when you come back to catalogs and you hear that you have one million species of insects and more than one million species of animals, blah, 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 the plants, etc. but only a few thousand species of bacteria and archaea, you have the impression that there's something wrong. And actually, it's simply that we haven't or we hadn't studied microbial diversity well because we didn't have the tools at the time. And these basic descriptions are based on uh, cultured microbes. And there is another problem, and it is the problem of uh, uh, the species concept. Because what you call a species for an animal is not maybe what we call a species for a prokaryote. And actually, we don't use very well this, uh, this, uh, this concept because we don't know how to use it. So there are different uh, definitions of what a species is. There is the morphological concept, similar morphology or similar phenotype uh, implies uh, the same species, that is the ecological uh, species concepts. Organisms that occupy the same ecological niche belong to the same species. But here we have a problem because it's very difficult. If defining a species is difficult, defining what is a niche is even more difficult. Then we have uh, the biological species concept, that is uh, organisms that can interbreed, have sexual reproduction, then belong to the same species, but that can only be applied for animals and plants or and perhaps some other microbes that have sex, eukaryotic microbes, but not to bacteria and archaea, which not, don't have sex in the in sense of meiosis, in the sense of uh, cell fusion. And then you have the phylogenetic species concepts uh, that would be the more universal in, 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 in the view of more, many people which is just based on evolutionary relatedness. And it, it implies the congruence uh, of gene phylogenies. Problems associated to that. Morphological species concept is that many, uh, in the case of bacteria, it doesn't work because uh, many uh, different species have the same morphology. But it, it can be also true even for eukaryotes. In the case of, for instance, very tiny algae, uh, like Micromonas pusilla, this is one example where you can show uh, that 
There are many cryptic species by a genetic analysis uh, that have cosmopolitan distribution. So we call cryptic species uh, uh, things that look alike, but genetically they are very different. So you can show that that happens also for eukaryotes that have, in particular, small eukaryotes. You have also problems for biological, uh, for the biological uh, species concept, even in animals and plants. Plants hybridize a lot. You can cross different things. You can make nectarines, etc. So you can uh, have interbreeding. Uh, with very different uh, plant species, and it all, it also applies to animals, at least some animals. So this guy is uh, the, uh, is a mixture of a tiger and a lion, and uh, the offspring is fertile. So you can have hybrid species even in mammals. So that is a problem. And in the case, of course, of prokaryotes, you could only apply the phylogenetic species concept because there is not a biological uh, species concept that you can apply, morphology doesn't work, and defining what is the ecological niche, we are very far away from doing that. So what we say is to, we apply this uh, operational uh, uh, proxy for species that is uh, an operational taxonomic unit. Usually you define a threshold. For many studies, this threshold is 97 person identity, uh, in terms of nucleotides for this particular marker gene, the ribosomal RNA gene, encoding for the ribosome, uh, the RNA in the small uh, subunit of the ribosome. And if you do that, and if you apply the prokaryotic species concept or operational concept uh, to uh, animals, well, you would have that all primates would belong to the same species but also mice. And you would have to go as far as the ornithorynch, which is really very far away from, let's say, uh, the rest of mammals, to go down to 95% person identity, which correspond, would correspond to the same genus. So it means that uh, effectively almost all mammals would be just one single prokaryotic species. So I'm meaning that the um, diversity uh, uh, in terms of numbers of species that re are reflected in catalogs is, uh, is somewhat misleading because uh, different species concepts are applied to prokaryotes and to animals. Okay, so that's one thing. Now I'm going to talk about a different story that is also kind of mixed conception and it relates to complexity. Um, so m for, for a very long time, or, and physicists uh, in particular, but also some biologists are trying to look for some kind of law impo imposing an increasing complexity in the world, extending to biology. So we know that there is physical and chemical evolution. You had a talk the other day on nucleosynthesis, so you can hydro you have hydrogen and then you can complexify atoms and have atoms that are uh, heavier and heavier and bigger and bigger. And then when you have that, you have also a chemical, so you have nucleosynthesis, but you have also a chemical evolution, the formation from atoms of uh, simple molecules that recombine and react. And so you have a wide variety of different molecules. So you have this impression that there is an evolution of, all, of matter in the universe uh, with an increasing complexity. And it is only tempting to say that it is happening also uh, in biology, that complexity always increases. And there, there are some attempts really to find some kind of law uh, that uh, would explain this uh, necessity of increasing complexity always. Um, complexity in terms of living units would uh, increase with time and at a given point, we don't see it, but there should appear a bar here saying at one given moment, we decide that from here, when you reach a certain, certain threshold of complexity, you have life, okay? And this could be also uh, uh, seen in terms of ecosystem interactions. So you, the more diversity you have, the more interactions can be established between different elements of the system. And that this is also complexity that can be measured. And there is this idea that complexity improves function and many people use, uh, uh, to explain that, uh, analogies uh, 
that have to do with technology. For instance, if you increase complexity, you can make uh, better airplanes that fly better, etc. So there is this idea that complexity improves function, which is actually wrong. Is it always true? It is not even true in technology. You can ha build very complicated airplanes and sometimes they fail or they crash uh, simply because they, they don't work well or maybe too complex or there's some problem. And you have also the low-cost companies that show that you can have uh, maintain the flying function to the minimum and it works very well and it, it expands. So this is an analogy that doesn't work very well and complexity does not always improve function and we have many examples of this. So does complexity always increase in biology? The always is important because complexity, there is of course an average increase on, of complexity, but does it always increase? Um, so you could imagine a situation like this where complexity increases linearly or exponentially if you want. And of course at the beginning, before life appeared, there must have been an increase in complexity. But perhaps at a given moment, you have some kind of asymptote and a tendency to stability in terms of complexity that you cannot, and this might happen uh, at the level of individuals, but also at the level of ecosystem interactions, that you saturate the number of interactions so that a system cannot accommodate more interactions than the ones that can be there. Maybe a lot of interactions, but there's a given number. And th so that you saturate the system. And there are examples showing that that might be the case, actually. And the thing is that we know that reductive evolution has been very, very important and is actually a very important uh, uh, form of evolution. So if you take the number of genes as a proxy for biological complexity, it uh, seems reasonable. The more genes you have, the more proteins, so you can be more complex. And by the way, this is a diagram showing the, uh, more or less the uh, size span in terms of genome of different groups of organisms. So you see that archaea and bacteria tend to have very compact, small genomes, uh, gene-rich, by the way. And then you have uh, organisms that have very different uh, genome sizes. Mammals are here. And actually many protists, so unicellular eukaryotes, have genomes that are much bigger than mammals and the human genome. So genome size that does not necessarily correlate with what we think uh, um, we are. But reductive evolution, gene loss in particular, is something that is pervasive. So in all groups of organisms, you have many organisms that tend to lose genes. That involves the parasites and many symbionts uh, that are obligate so that they depend on another organism, so they lose genes. So they, you can reduce the, numbers of gene, the number of genes. Uh, but also free living species. And actually you can see that today because we have many genomes already sequenced and you can count the number of genes that you have. And this has led some authors to propose that there is some kind of punctuated genome evolution where you have massive acquisition of genes by horizontal gene transfer that happens very often in, in prokaryotes, for instance, but also gen genome duplication <coughs> in, in many eukaryotes. You have whole genome duplication, so you multiply by two the number of genes, and then you have losses. And this has happened recurrently several times in evolution. So you have a sudden increase of genes in a particular genome, and then you lose genes. And that's a documented process that genome, uh, comparative genomics can reveal. So reductive evolution is actually an ongoing process, very important. So complexity not always increases. Another misconception that is very important, <coughs> simple implies primitive. That's very, that's anchored in our minds. Um, and actually, uh, there are counterexamples. One, uh, one of that, for instance, is the microsporidia. Microsporidia are uh, very tiny parasites. These are eukaryotic cells that are very simple. Uh, they have a polar tube for infection, and they can cause different uh, problems, uh, health problems, uh, very widespread. And actually, at the beginning, 
when the first molecular trees, phylogenetic trees, were done uh, with these guys using the ribosomal RNA gene, they turned out to be placed at the base of the eukaryotes at a time where we were talking about crown eukaryotes or higher and lower eukaryotes. Those are wrong terms, but anyway, I will come back to that. And that comforted the idea because these organisms lack apparent mitochondria, well, some particular organelles that were thought not to be present in these organisms. They were very easily classified as archezoa. They were thought to uh, um, be primitive eukaryotes that predated the acquisition of mitochondria, the organelle, the organelle where you make oxygen respiration in the rest of eukaryotes. So that fitted this story very nice, but that is wrong. And we know today that this kind of tree was uh, actually the result of an artifact of phylogenetic uh, uh, reconstruction uh, because this, uh, the, the gene of this parasite evolved very fast and that tends to pull the branch towards the base of the tree. And actually we now have much more diversity and we can place this organism well within eukaryotes and in particular not so far from animals and fungi. It, it's, it's actually an organism related to fungi. So what has happened is that this organism has reduced many things, has even lost most of the mitochondrial functions. So reduction is very important. And simple is not primitive, simple is actually derived in this particular case. Another uh, idea that simple implies primitive for a long time or some people, and this is still very strongly anchored in, 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 in many uh, books and, on, and authors, is the idea that uh, viruses, because uh, they are very simple, uh, they predate uh, uh, cells. And actually Hermann Müller, who coined the term gene, uh, thought that genes and viruses could be equivalent at that time. We didn't even know that uh, genetic uh, material was DNA. Uh, and then he proposed that the first organism was a virus, was a primitive gene, was uh, this kind of a very simple uh, genetic structure. Until, um, and even John Haldane said at the time that life might have uh, remained in this virus stage for many million years before suitable assembly of uh, units uh, form a cell. And then later uh, he, even, he changed his mind uh, because uh, Andre Lwoff and, 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 other, and other authors uh, clearly show that uh, uh, Reductive evolution was very important in biology by looking at parasites and that viruses might be products also of regressive evolution. It is not necessarily the case, but we now know that viruses uh, escape from cells in a cell just because the capsid actually derives from cellular proteins. So now we have evidence that viruses were not at, at all primitive and not predated cells but evolved after cells or along with cells. Another uh, f kind of uh, false idea is that we tend to think that unicellular organisms are simple, but they can be highly complex. And one example is here. You have this uh, kind, these are dinoflagellates, who are novia species. Uh, so one single cell, a few microns. And they have a structure that it looks like an eye, actually. It has a cornea, a lens, and a retinal body that is made with a chloroplast, by the way. And they can, can, can kind of see uh, and capture some prey in some cases. So you have this, uh, another species of dinoflagellate that has this kind of eye uh, and that can perceive prey passing by and project itself with some kind of piston to catch the prey, okay? So this is uh, extreme complexity in a single cell. So our cells are not as complex as these ones. So there is this idea that bacteria, unicellular species in general, are less involved than animals and plants. That's a misconception. And you still see in many textbooks this five kingdom classification by Whittaker. Uh, where you place bacteria, monera, at the base of the tree, and then protists, so eukaryotic unicellular species, 
uh, emerge from bacteria and then we have on top plants, fungi, animals. So people talk about higher eukaryotes and lower microbes, etc. This is completely wrong and actually this recalls uh, some uh, sc uh, Scala Natura uh, conceptions that are not very scientific where you can have rocks, flames, plants and even more fancy creatures on top. So this is some kind of intuitive uh, construct that we have and this uh, looks more like an object of faith than anything else. So we have actually, by exploring nature and in particular microbial diversity and by making phylogeny show that this conception is wrong and that what we have today, and it's not very clear, but, but anyway, I, I guess that you can see that, is that um, actually from uh, the initial steps of the prebiotic chemistry, the origin of life, maybe there are different branches, we have a last universal common ancestor, and there is a wide diversification of, of organisms forming the three uh, major domains of life. Uh, uh, that reach the top, okay? So you have, um, I have another slide, well, we don't see necessarily much better, so we have from this last universal common ancestor, some extinct branches around, we have a diversification with time, and you have today a wide diversity or li of lineages that are all modern. So bacteria are not more primitive than human. We are contemporary. If, if anything, they would be more evolved. But anyway, so of course, we are here and some particular branch. And if you come back to the last common ancestor, something unicellular, simple, prokaryotic like, and you come back to us, there is an increase in complexity. But if you take any other species, most of the rest of species that are contemporary today, you don't see necessarily an increase in complexity with time, okay? It has to do with what is more efficient in the different environments where you are. And you are selected. Bacteria do very well, actually. Do much better than we do in many cases. So, not primitive. Bacteria are not primitive. They are there. And, and related to that, evolution is an ongoing process. So, bacteria always evolve. Species are not fixed entities. You cannot uh, preserve biodiversity. You cannot froze, uh, freeze biodiversity unless you do it in your fridge. A sp species evolve, including bacteria. So bacteria also evolve. Of course, you don't see that in terms of morphology, but in terms of function. So you have new species of bacteria. For instance, think about domesticated bacteria that we have manipulated or they selected for and then they are new species or the bacteria that you have in your gut when humans were not here when mammals were not here those bacteria were not here so they are new species that have evolved and co-evolved with us they are evolving all the time bacteria also evolve they are not primitive on the same line living fossils do not exist so Take the cell account. The cell account is a modern organism. It has, uh, of course, y this is a tree of cell account, or, or, uh, the cell account is Latimeria here, and there are uh, fossil organisms from which you can construct a phylogenetic tree based on morphology, based on the bones, etc. And there are differences between the fossil uh, uh, skeletons and the skeleton of the cell account. You just have to pay attention to those differences. And also we have the idea, but that's another, another problem, if you try, uh, that can be a visual perception of trees. If you make a phylogenetic tree with Latimeria, the cell account, and you put all the dif different vertebrates here, and you put uh, Homo and, and, and the ma mouse here, uh, you have the impression that it is deep and it, that it is primitive because it is at the base of the tree. But this is very tricky because you can remove uh, that and the distance between Homo and Latimeria is the same independently on, of the species that you put in the middle. So you could reconstruct a tree including the relatives of Latimeria with Homo at the base. You wouldn't interpret from that. You shouldn't interpret that Homo is primitive. So th that you can play also with that. And coming perhaps more towards an end because I'm talking too much, uh, 
Just I wanted to mention that actualism has its limits. So of course, actualism is very useful to understand some kind of processes. So this idea that the present is the key to the past. So some processes acting today may, be, uh, act, may have acted also in the past and they are useful. So we know some examples. Uh, for instance, some of you saw yesterday some of these ripple marks uh, from the Archean that are, so this kind of process are operating still today. So we can say that these things were forming uh, close to a tidal area or to the, to the water because we have the same processes operating today. And perhaps some of these processes were also operating, uh, for instance, to precipitate carbonates and form stromatolites <coughs> in the past, just as we see today. But it is very, uh, and, and forming this kind of stromatolites that we saw yesterday. So that's why we think these structures, these fossil structures are uh, stromatolites because we think that the biological uh, trigger of carbonate precipitation was also operating in the past this way. But it does not necessarily apply to the organisms that were forming these structures. And actually, uh, I guess that Emmanuel already showed you that you can have morphologies today that resemble things that we see in the fossil record, uh, but that these, or, uh, these kind of objects are not actually uh, even biological, and so that morphology can be uh, uh, problematic. I'm, I'm going to pass on that. You can have biomorphs or structures that look like modern cells or filaments, uh, but are made just abiotically. So you cannot apply uh, this kind of actualism all, all the time <coughs> because you can have alternative natural causes <coughs> leading to things that look alike. You, so you have also to consider, always to consider alternative explanations <coughs> for a given phenomena. <coughs> and the same applies to uh, this type of fossils that some people claim uh, in uh, some hematite tubes in, in, in some rocks uh, almost 3.8 billion years old in, in, in Canada, uh, saying that, uh, uh, okay, we have today bacteria that form this type of tubes uh, in uh, uh, close to hydrothermal vents, but uh, you also can form these structures <coughs> abiotically and look at the size, it has nothing to do. So we don't know that today, actually, even today, that's false. So this is one micron, this is 100. So size is not the same. It's not the same thing. Some people call that dubio fossils. So this is just to say that analogy, uh, like uh, actua actualism has its limits. So analogy is extremely useful to, uh, for outreach, to communicate, to uh, make, try to make people understand uh, concepts, but it has not an explanatory power in science, not at all. And so, uh, actually, uh, the, the, the message of this kind of slide is that uh, uh, birds are not airplanes, and, and these are not even birds, this is just a drawing. And the final word on panspermia, because in the context of astrobiology, we also hear a lot about pan panspermia, which uh, <coughs> uh, etymologically means seeds everywhere. <coughs> and there is a lot of confusion with this term. So some people talk about soft panspermia uh, for the dispersal of organics in the universe. You have comets, you have meteorites that they move um, organic matter around that forms elsewhere. Some people talk about lithopanspermia. You can have rocks because you can bring meteorites on Earth, let's say, why not? You could even imagine that there is some kind of local spermia, I would say, so that you could transfer life from Mars to the Earth. Okay, it is extremely unlikely, very extremely unlikely, but you could imagine that. But panspermia itself is not a scientific theory for the origin of life, not at all. It just pushes the, the problem elsewhere. And uh, panspermia, as it was defined at the beginning, uh, some people talk about cosmic panspermia, is a form of vitalism. So this is, this is faith. This has to do with religion. This is creationism. And, uh, so some, uh, and this is not really scientific. Okay? So please be 
be careful with this because uh, it's um, it's tricky. And some intelligent design people, etc., they are also working on that. And so take home messages, just uh, as clear reminders. Um, most biological diversity lies in the microbial world. I hope to have convinced you about that. Uh, simply we lack the real, the good tools to explore microbial diversity and that is only logical because they have been evolving microbes for more than four, 4 billion years perhaps and we just appeared yesterday in a, in a time scale. Um, complexity does not necessarily increase in biological systems. Uh, reductive evolution is extremely important and we have evidence for that from genomes. Simple does not necessarily mean primitive, uh, absolutely not. Many reduct the reduced systems are very simple just because they are derived, they are reduced. Bacteria are not less evolved than animals or plants. We, they are not primitive. The mo bacteria that we see today are as modern as we are. Uh, living fossils do not exist. Species are not fixed entities. Evolution is always ongoing. You cannot prevent prevent evolution from happening unless you froze everything, you freeze everything at minus 80. Actualism and analogy have some value but very limited in science. That's for outreach and need to be used with caution really. And this is especially important in this community because, because we are physicists and chemists and biologists. We need to use a lot of analogies to try to communicate Please pay attention, that is extremely important and you have to be very cautious. And of course, panspermia is not a scientific theory on the origin of life. Thank you very much.